Well, everyone, and welcome to our proceedings today, uh, to the public and to the media, and also to our, our guests from Alternatives North. I'm Kieran Testart, member of the Legislative Assembly for Cam Lake. I'm also Deputy Chair of the Priorities and Planning Committee. We're going to start by uh, going around the committee table and introducing the, the members. And we'll start with uh, Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Frederick Blake, MLA for Mackenzie Delta. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Herb Nakamak, MLA for Nanakbu. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Shane Thompson, Nahendi. Hi there, Corey Van Thine, MLA for Yellowknife North. Dan McNeely, Santee Region. RJ Simpson, Hay River North. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Julie Green, Yellowknife Center. Thank you. And uh, we'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Thompson, if you could introduce yourself. Or Mr. McDonald. Mr. McDonald, if you could sure. introduce yourself and your guests and uh, proceed with the, the uh, presentation. Thank yes, you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, uh, I am here uh, as a, a member of Alternatives North, and uh, we have, uh, have contracted uh, Dave and Diana to, uh, to bring some discussion points here for, uh, for your consideration. I'll just give, a, a, if you could, about a 30-second backgrounder on Alternatives North. It's a social justice coalition that operates in the Northwest Territories. We have affiliation from, uh, from faith groups, uh, uh, groups interested in dealing with poverty, labor, um, and we have individuals, seniors, others. It's been in operation for, uh, I think, 16 or 17 years now. And uh, we have had occasion to produce a number of papers that, uh, uh, for consideration by, by the public and by the members of the Legislative Assembly on these matters uh, in times past, uh, going up to, you know, as far back as, uh, like at least 10 years ago that we've been involved in this, the, the, uh, trying to uh, bring a different perspective, I guess, or, or uh, our perspective on, on issues to, uh, to the attention of the public. And so by, by contracting uh, uh, people to, uh, to do research and to produce papers for us. Uh, so we have uh, uh, with us uh, uh, Dave Thompson and Diana Gibson from the Policy Link research and consulting uh, firm. They're presently in uh, Victoria, but spent uh, 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 like more than a decade, I think, in Alberta prior to going there a few years ago. So I, I'm not going to do much more on that. If they believe that they should uh, come up with uh, more on that, then they can introduce themselves. But uh, I'd like to thank you all for uh, listening to us and giving us the opportunity to, to bring forward what we think is very important information for your consideration. So I'll pass it over to Dave. Mr. Thompson. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having us. I'm Dave Thompson. I have a background in law and economics and worked in the Ontario government for a while before uh, uh, the founding Policy Link with uh, Diana, um, I don't know, 15 years ago or something like that. Uh, and Diana, maybe you want to introduce yourself a bit before we start. Yeah, my background, uh, political economist, and I ran a think tank at the University of Alberta uh, for 10 years that focused on budget and policy in resource-rich jurisdictions. So we did work, we partnered with Alternative North for, for uh, uh, 10 years. We've been working in collaboration around research on the challenges associated with being in um, northern jurisdictions and in community places where you've got a highly rural based population um, and resource wealth and the challenges and opportunities so places like newfoundland labrador alberta nwt yukon um, and and we've done a, a number of reports with alternative north on revenue starting in 2008 um, and um, looking at revenue opportunities and budget challenges mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thompson okay well, we'll take it away. Diana tells me that I speak too slowly, so I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit. My apologies if I talk too fast. Um, so uh, just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today, a little bit of the global context, and then spending and potential cuts and revenue options, with a conclusion that uh, um, the GNWT is in a position to make fiscal choices, budget choices, that support a strong future economy. <clears throat> so the global context, it's all bad news, I'm afraid. Uh, and getting worse. Uh, low global energy prices and, and uh, prices for other commodities too. Um, I saw in the news this morning uh, oil heading down from 27. Uh, and these prices are likely to remain low for a long time, as I'm sure you know. And it's not just about inventories, global inventories being high and Iran's exports coming back online soon. 
uh, it's, it's something more like what people are calling the end of the commodity super cycle that lasted for, uh, well, for the, as long as we've been in consulting. Um, <clears throat> so the fundamentals are what's driving this. Uh, demand is lower everywhere. Uh, Asia is no longer growing at, uh, or China is no longer growing at 10 percent, and a lot of other Asian countries are, are slowing down. You can't do 10 percent forever. Um, and then the global long-term supply uh, is also changed the picture there, particularly for fossil fuels. Uh, technology developments have just resulted in uh, the potential for, for producing much more than there is demand for right now. Some of that, tech, some of that uh, production capacity is turned off at, at the moment, and it is, when the prices go up, it can be switched on with a flick of a switch, uh, is what they're saying. And then there's a question of whether OPEC on, on oil, whether OPEC has actually damaged its own ability to constrain supply, which used to be OPEC's game, if you'll recall, if anybody's as old as I am and remembers the 70s and 80s. Uh, that's what OPEC used to do, and now OPEC is all about let's expand supply and, and uh, grab market share. Uh, so for some reason, that's no longer working. Oh, okay, there we go. So what's the local impact of these global changes? You're going to know better than we are, but uh, uh, what we're aware of is reduced uh, investment in non-renewable energy. Um, the uh, Premier stated the oil and gas industry has packed up and left the NWT. We don't expect to see any exploration for probably 10 years. That's probably a fair assessment. Uh, what we understand is that Satu oil needs to be at about 100 bucks a barrel to uh, get to market. And the, the long-term forecasts have been going down over time. Uh, the most recent ones from Standard & Poor's and Goldman Sachs is about 50 bucks a barrel for long-term oil. So uh, we uh, also don't expect to see uh, exploration uh, in the saw too much. Um, and the impacts of that uh, from both the oil and gas side and the mining, uh, obviously workers and their families and communities are going to be affected, increasingly affected. And there could be an impact on GNWT revenues. There's a lot more to see in the future on this, what the, what the impacts are going to be. We'll know uh, in hindsight what, the, what they will be, but uh, I think it's a pretty clear picture now. And the possibility of outmigration. <clears throat> so what does that mean for spending? Well, uh, it used to be that the, the sort of knee-jerk mantra was uh, cut, 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 as soon as there's uh, uh, tr economic clouds on the horizon. I think we all learned in 2008 that that was a bad idea. The economists, the global financial institutions told us uh, spend, and indeed that's what governments did. And that long round of spending by a lot of governments worldwide is, was credited for staving off uh, an economic collapse. So I think that that, that uh, knee-jerk reaction, we've been told that it's not right, and uh, it's been demonstrated that the stimulus actually does work. So the question is now, uh, here locally, uh, should the GNWT be cutting? And uh, um, it can, cutting can at least temporarily uh, change your financial statements, but then you've got impacts on employment, uh, impacts on private sector businesses, uh, because the, the economy is connected, um, and you've got the potential for out migration, and that can blow back on your financial statements as well as blowing back on the economy. So, with a focus on the future, what about spending? Uh, well, the, the question here is really where are the jobs going to be in the future? Uh, are we going to be aiming at spending money now on non-renewable resource extraction if that's a risky investment, if that extraction isn't going to be happening at the same pace? Are we going to be building roads and bridges to nowhere <clears throat> if we're looking at building roads and bridges to extraction sites? So it's a risky, risky idea. Uh, another idea is to spend money in the direction of an economy that is more diversified, uh, more local and more durable. Uh, some people call that the triple bottom line. It's sustainable in terms of social, environmental, and economic needs. <clears throat> and also spending money on, on those who are most vulnerable to the high cost of living. And uh, we're going to get into revenues. Uh, some of those revenues are going to drive up the cost of living. Uh, so it's important to remember that spending area as well. And, and finally, we have a suggestion for a, a developing a screening lens uh, and looking at new items of spending to determine whether they're going to help build a sustainable economy or not.
So this is where I turn it over to the brains of the outfit, Diana Gibson, to talk a little bit about some of those spending areas based on a, a research report that she just introduced yesterday. Thank yeah, you. Just, um, for those oh, who just weren't. A minute. Thank oh. you, Mr. Uh, Thompson. Before, just before we go any further, sure. I just want to welcome and acknowledge the presence of uh, Mr. Bob Romley in the audience uh, today. He's a longtime member for the constituency of Walliday, and it's great to see him taking an interest today. Uh, for uh, uh, further ado, Ms. Gibson. Thanks. Um, the Saatchi Region report that was put out by Alternatives North yesterday discusses alternatives to that sort of silver bullet. So there's there's two approaches to economic development. There's one where you sort of hang your hat on, on, a, on a mega project with foreign investment that creates sort of a large economic driver. Um, and there's an alternative approach which has talked about a sort of an economic gardening approach of, of building an economy from, from the local um, entrepreneur base up. So supporting local folks to engage in business. And, um, and so this Saatchi Region report looks at contrasting those two models, the sort of the risks of, of hitching your wagon to a um, foreign investment mega project versus <clears throat> the challenges of building a local sustainable economy from the ground up. It talks about some of the amazing op uh, um, work that ours already is happening on the ground in terms of tourism, energy efficiency, renewable energies, um, traditional harvesting, trapping, all sorts of projects um, and undertakings and businesses that are already being successful. Um, so it's certainly not about starting fresh. It's about, it's about um, the government getting out of the way of that to make sure it can build and prioritizing it. Um, and, and then it look, looks at some of the job effects of that. Is that something you're going into subsequently? Um, no. Oh, the, I think it's the next slide, is it? You want me to, if you, I can switch slides. Yeah, so then the, the other thing we look at in here is sort of the relative bang for your buck that you get by different sectors. This is based on territory-wide numbers um, for each different sector, how many jobs you get for a million dollars put in. And it's, it's not, it doesn't give you absolute terms, you know, guarantee of how many jobs you're going to get when you put a dollar into a sector. But it gives you a sense of the relative bang for your buck on where you're investing your dollars in terms of return in jobs. Um, so you can see that sort of some of the industries hunting, fishing, trapping, um, transportation, arts, um, repair and maintenance, you know, sort of are places where you get more jobs per dollar than places like diamond mining and oil and gas. Um, so it just gives you a relative sense. <coughs> the other thing that the report um, talks about is, is the fact that it's not just the sector you put in in terms of what return you get on your dollar, but it matters who owns the business. And, and whether it's big or small. So for example, a locally owned tourism operation is gonna have more dollars circulating in the local economy than a foreign owned tourism business. Um, and the, the data is really clear that locally owned businesses give you multiple times the jobs and, and economic stimulus. So a dollar that goes into an, a, a tourism business that's locally owned is gonna circulate more times in the local economy than a dollar that goes into a foreign owned business. And that applies to a retail business, it applies to a restaurant, it applies to tourism operations. So if you want to be building an economy that does see that economic circulation, that GDP stimulus locally, um, smaller scale locally owned businesses are, are a, a better way to go for in terms of economic um, activity and being an economic driver than a large foreign owned business if your priority is jobs and local economic activity. Thank you, Ms. Gibson. Can I? Mr. McDonald. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just, uh, the report that uh, Diana just referred to will be distributed to the, uh, to all the members today, so you'll be able to get a chance to look at it in depth if you want. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Thank McDonald. You. Mr. Thompson. Um, uh, so switching gears a little bit um, uh, into the uh, impact of potential cuts. So I, I mentioned earlier that uh, government spending cuts will have impacts outside of the civil service, uh, so families and communities. Uh, in terms of the private sector impact of government spending cuts, um, there would be both indirect and induced job losses. So this is the, the, the same terms that are used in, in when you're talking about multipliers for investments. So the indirect jobs that come from an investment or jobs lost from a, from a cut uh, are those supplying the industries where the investment or cut is being made. And the induced job gains or losses from an investment or a cut are those relating to uh, people employed in industries where those workers spend their money. So basically, the idea is uh, an economy is not uh, just a, a few people over here. An economy is an entire network. And if you make a change over here, you're going to feel that change elsewhere in the network. 
um, included in the private sector. So in 2008, there were some proposals for, for spending and job cuts, um, and uh, we gave a very rough uh, estimate of how many jobs could be affected in the private sector there. It was a $135 million cut, uh, and we estimated on the order of magnitude of 1,000 jobs, give or take. These are very rough figures, as, as governments acknowledge when they publish these multiplier uh, figures. Uh, they're meant to be indicative rather than precise. So the induced jobs are, are really local jobs. Uh, and unfortunately, the government does not publish the multipliers for the induced jobs. However, other governments do and have published multipliers uh, for induced effects. And based on those, it's, it looks like for every 10 civil service cut jobs cut here, you'll probably cut on the order of about five in the public sector or private sector. Give or take, uh, there's a little plus or minus there. Um, <clears throat> certainly, having the induced multipliers from the government would help us give a more accurate estimate, but I think that's a good order of magnitude estimate. Um, so, if, you're, if your budget is stretched and you need to, uh, need to balance it, and um, the impact of cuts is unpalatable, which I think it is, uh, then we look at revenues. So um, they sometimes say that money doesn't grow on trees. Well, program services and infrastructure also don't grow on trees. Um, you need money to spend in order to get the things you want. So I say that to my kids and they say, duh. Uh, and they, they point out that adults sometimes need to be reminded of obvious things. Um, taxes are, have been called the price we pay for civilization. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, as legislators, uh, that there's a lot of things <clears throat> outside of this building and inside of this building that uh, if we didn't have taxes, we couldn't pay for at all. So in 2008, uh, 117 economists signed a letter uh, in New York pointing out that um, it's both theory and experience show that it's preferable to raise taxes on people with high incomes than it is to cut state expenditures. <clears throat> And I think as a result of that 2008 experience with, um, with stimulus spending that I mentioned, the whole idea of being strongly anti-tax seems to have started to lose traction. Uh, governments have done a lot of public opinion polling. They've listened to the economists. They saw what happened in 2008, and they've moved on, and they've, they've been spending, uh, and they've raised taxes. So where have they raised taxes? <clears throat> We've got a number of examples. Uh, in Alberta, um, the Conservative government before the NDP talked about raising a whole bunch of taxes, uh, moving off of their flat tax and going to a progressive in uh, income tax with higher rates at the top end, uh, raising tobacco taxes, alcohol taxes, fuel taxes. Uh, then the NDP got in and kept a lot of those changes and added a little bit more. Uh, uh, more tax brackets and uh, raise corporate taxes. Uh, Newfoundland's Conservative government uh, had a range of tax and fee increases. Uh, an increase in the HST was one of those. Uh, another one was uh, higher brackets for top income earners. <clears throat> in Ontario, the uh, Liberal governments, so you've got all three parties here, Conservative, NDP and Liberal, uh, raising taxes. You've got uh, uh, raising of the top rates in Ontario, I think having a, a surcharge, um, aviation fuel, tobacco taxes, the federal government in 2015 uh, raising the top personal uh, bracket from 29 to 33 percent. The BC government uh, calls itself liberal, it's probably conservative, uh, introducing higher personal income tax bracket at the top and raising corporate rates. So these just some examples, it's happening all over the place. Um, the sort of no new taxes is, is uh, a thing of the past. <clears throat> oh, I forgot to mention Quebec. Um, personal income tax increases, taxes on dividend income and capital gains, and more recently, a shift towards sales taxes. So it's happening elsewhere. Uh, it doesn't raise eyebrows anymore. Uh, if you look at a comparison on, this is a bit complicated, this graph. Di, you have a better explanation for this graph. Why don't you? Um, Ms. Sure. Uh, Gibson. Oh, may I? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. 
the formalities. Um, the, what we've done is taken the tax filer data for the NWT and applied every other jurisdiction's tax rates um, to it, so um, tax brackets and rates. And what you see um, is the NWT, um, which is on the far right, um, and that red line is showing where the NWT sits. And then you can see that it lines up closely to BC. That be, if they had BC, if, you, if, if we had BC's tax system here, we would get about three million more in revenues. And then it goes up from there. You can see Alberta's tax system would generate 24 million more for the Northwest Territories. Um, and it ranges um, up to about um, to 197 million more with Quebec's tax system. Um, so you can see that there's certainly um, a lot of room for changing the, the income tax system to become more progressive in the Northwest Territories. Um, the, the median uh, or the mean um, average uh, is would raise about a, about 82 million more. Just hitting the provincial, the mean of the other provinces and territories would generate 82 million more. So that's just moving up halfway to meet the other provinces and territories in terms of the potential for generating revenue with a more progressive income tax system. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Personal income taxes uh, and also uh, payroll taxes are another area that can be changed. So uh, there are those figures that Diana mentioned for the um, uh, mean average, 82 million a year just from adopting the average um, system. Uh, if you also look at just uh, the shape of the system, if you uh, raised the top bracket by 2%, you would still be below the average of the top bracket taxation rate for the other provinces and territories. <clears throat> so there's room to move is all we're illustrating here. Um, on the payroll tax, uh, the, the advantage of the payroll tax, of course, is that uh, it gets collected here. So you don't have the same leakage in revenues that you can have with uh, uh, workers who uh, uh, claim their in uh, income elsewhere. Uh, however, it does penalize workers to the extent that it's a tax on, on wages as opposed to a tax on other forms of income like uh, uh, dividends. Um, but you can also target it a little bit more, uh, raising the rates on top earners uh, and reducing it for lower earners. <clears throat> um, corporate income taxes, that's another place where there's room to move. Uh, and here, the graph is a little bit different than the one uh, Diana described. Um, here, we're just looking at the tax rate uh, in the Northwest Territories, uh, 11 and a, it looks about 11 and a half percent there. And you can just see that almost every other jurisdiction has a higher uh, general tax rate for corporations. Uh, and the small business, uh, NWT is probably a bit more towards the middle of the pack, maybe even a bit above the middle of the pack. Probably not a place where you want to be seen to be raising taxes. <clears throat> and, um, Just a moment, Ms. Green. Oh. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, could you uh, give me a definition of small business in this context, please? Thank, thank you, you, Ms. Green. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Yep. Jeez, uh, it's a Canadian controlled private corporation with, I believe, a revenue of under $500,000 per year. I would have to check that, and I'd be happy to do that. And, confirm it for you later. Thank yep. you. Anything further, Ms. Green? That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Nakamayak? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on your graph, can you identify which one is Northwest Territories? Yeah. My uh, apologies. Ms. Thompson. Oh, sorry. My apologies. It's the NW there, which I realize is not uh, how it's normally expressed. Um, so the second one from the right. <clears throat> thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. So looking at uh, a collection of taxes that might uh, apply to corporations, there's uh, capital taxes. And this, this uh, brings us back to one of the reports that we prepared uh, back in 2008, um, A Fair Price Taxes, Taxation Services and Programs in the Northwest Territories, where we went through the government's then uh, revenue options paper and provided some commentary on that. So a lot of these numbers come either from the government's revenue options paper or from our analysis of it. So our capital tax um, uh, structured the way it was in the revenue options paper, could raise 12 million a year. Uh, corporate income tax change could raise uh, 8 million a year by just a 1% increase. 
resource income tax, as described in the revenue options paper, could raise $34 million per diamond mine per year. Um, we suggested in our, our analysis that that might be an appropriate source of revenue for the uh, Northwest Territories Heritage Fund, which didn't exist yet then, but we were, we were uh, suggesting it. <coughs> and then uh, royalties, which you're uh, currently collecting, um, an option for looking at the revenues there might be to review and, and test, test the buyer's market. Uh, there's uh, to just to determine whether the people of the Northwest Territories are getting the best price. Uh, um, Alberta has been through a, a couple of uh, reviews of its royalties and it makes sense to do it every once in a while. Um, sales tax, um, there currently isn't one in the Northwest Territories, of course. Uh, most other uh, subnational jurisdictions in Canada do have one, so again, we're not arguing that you should have a sales tax, it's more like pointing out here's another option uh, if you're feeling constrained um, on your financial statements. <coughs> uh, the HST system, uh, if you joined it, could raise $59 million a year. Uh, without it, a retail sales tax system could raise $6 million a year for every percentage point on the, uh, on the tax. And to uh, offset the impacts of that on, in terms of the cost of living, you can have exemptions, of course, for important things like food uh, and uh, utilities and other essentials. And you can have tax credits as well, directly giving cash to people who need it to let them decide where to spend their money <coughs> and help address their cost of living. Different people are going to have different needs. <coughs> uh, apart from the broad sales tax, there's a number of uh, more precise taxes, more uh, focused taxes. Uh, tourism is one that sounds like it has a lot of promise now um, with the Asian uh, tourism growth going on. I understand that there are three hotels that are either under construction or, or that there's plans for them. Thank you. Uh, and there's eight uh, new operators looking at uh, running tourism businesses, not necessarily all from here, so there's a good chance of revenue leakage outside of the territories, uh, especially if everything's supplied other than hotel rooms is coming from outside the territories. Um, <clears throat> related to uh, tourism also is the hotel tax. Uh, now back in 2008, the government estimated with its revenue options paper that a, a tax of 8% could raise $4 million a year. Uh, a tax of 16% would then raise $8 million a year. Uh, that's based on 2008 levels of tourism and occupancy. Uh, with the additional hotel space, you'd probably have a lot more than that. Um, an airport departures tax at $40 a flight would raise $4.7 million a year. I can tell you as a business traveler who flies anywhere from one to six times a month that I wouldn't notice that and I wouldn't notice the hotel tax either. It wouldn't make a bit of difference to me. Um, the costs, these are a very small proportion of overall trip costs. I also had a quick look this morning just to verify my instincts at the what's called the elasticity of, uh, in relation to the taxation and confirmed that, that uh, the academic studies out there report that, that hotel taxes are very inelastic, which just means that you put the tax on, the hotel owner passes it on to the, the business traveler or tourist, uh, and they pay it, and there's not much impact on, on uh, business. And I think in the revenue options paper, too, it pointed out that there wasn't much impact uh, anticipated from this type of tax. Uh, tobacco and liquor. Um, all jurisdictions routinely look, uh, look to this for their revenues, uh, not only because it provides revenues, but also um, that it can help reduce youth uptake and addictions uh, and therefore reduce your health care spending. So you get a, a couple of bangs for your buck on this one. You get, uh, you get the revenues and you reduce your spending. Um, uh, we pointed out in 2008 that you know, on tobacco taxes there was room to raise one or two million a year, liquor taxes uh, maybe closer to five million a year, just from uh, fairly modest increases. <clears throat> um, in terms of uh, fuel tax, carbon tax, and commercial <laughs> freight toll, uh, we pointed out 18, mil 18 million a year was available for uh, fuel taxes. That was both for transportation and non-transportation. You might consider just doing it for transportation uh, and leaving the heating fuel uh, at its current uh, rate. Uh, carbon taxes, we've had a lot of experience with uh, BC's carbon tax at this point. Uh, uh, BC adopted it a long time ago now, 
uh, and their economic growth has outpaced the Canadian average growth since the tax went on uh, with redu significant reductions in, in uh, carbon emissions. Uh, we estimated that it could raise 41 million a year. 